Welcome to We Plus You, straight talk about conscious business collaborations. And I am really excited today because today I have back with me Mary C. Kelly. And what I love about her is she truly gets what conscious business collaborations means. And today we're going to be talking about her book, Master Your World. And what I like about it is Master Your World. Because, you know, what we need to understand about mastering, it's not just, it's the collaboration. It's your world. However, it's also our world. And she truly gets that. So welcome, Mary. I'm so happy that you're back. Carly, it's a pleasure to see you again. How are you? Oh, my God. I'm just, I'm thrilled to have you back because I truly understand that you truly get what collaborations mean. And I love your book. I can't tell you how much I love your book. Number one, I know that you love dogs, and I absolutely love dogs as well. And I am just thrilled about the book because I was reading it, and it just is so beyond true about mastering our worlds and your world. They're, they're just so intertwined. It's just amazing. So I'd love for you to share with the audience how you actually came about writing this book and the, co the correlation and the parallels between, you know, the dog and mastering our world and the title of the book master your world I just love it it's just so profound it's not even funny well thank you look I'll give you a quick idea of how I came up with the idea for this book and in a very short story I was active duty in the Navy but I was also doing some part-time teaching for Hawaii Pacific University right there in Kaneohe as you know and my dean called me on a Thursday night and said, we need a short article for the Sunday paper on something to do with business or leadership. And I said, okay. He said, is there anything you can do? I said, sure. So an hour later, I sent him an article. He told me the deadline was an hour. I said, fine, no problem. Write an article. I wrote three leadership principles from the dog that you can use for business. So the great thing about that was those three principles are the basis for this book but what happened the newspaper got fan mail about this little article and then they said well can you give us more business ideas from the dog and then it was management from the dog and then work like a dog maybe you should and other th financial lessons from the dog so this whole theme resonated with people for a couple reasons first as you know Americans love dogs. People around the world love dogs. But in America, we spend $53 billion a year on our pets. That's a lot of money. So people clearly do love their dogs. And trying to make leadership and business principles something that people want to read, something that's fun for people to read, and something that's easily related, relatable somehow resonated. So. I took a series of those articles and put it together in some casual talks when I was doing some talks for civic groups. I was still in the Navy. We get asked to speak a lot and that's what happened. Eventually when I retired from the Navy I took those series of articles and then the keynotes that I had been doing and put it into a book um, which is Master Your World, 10 Dog Inspired Leadership Lessons to Improve Productivity, Profit and Communication. So let's walk through them. Let's actually walk through those. You said there's 10, correct? Yes. Okay, so let's actually walk through those 10, those 10 actually mini lessons. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's, let's start with one. Sure. So the lesson one is reward good behavior. And if you ask people in your workplace and you ask them, do you feel as though you are appreciated enough? The answer resoundingly is no. We are living in a nation, and I think a world, that underappreciates people for their efforts as well as their results. So because of that, people don't feel as though what they're doing, especially when they're doing it well, is acknowledged. Many times our leaders, our managers, are busy, and they say, well, Carly's doing such a good job, we don't need to give her any feedback, she knows she's doing a good job. But the opposite is true. Carly may be working 10, 12 hours a day, working really hard, and she's hoping she's doing the right thing, but she doesn't know. And if we just appreciated people and gave them feedback when they're doing really well, people would be more motivated. And I liken this to dog training. So if you want a puppy to do something right, you call the dog's name, you get their attention, they look up, maybe you have a treat in your hand, and you show them the treat, so now you really have their attention, 
and you say, puppy, come, and the dog comes running toward you and they get a treat. They've learned that if they come, they get a treat. You've rewarded the good behavior. But we don't do this in business. When people do the right thing, we frequently just ignore it or we say, well, that's why they get a paycheck or that's why they fill in the blank. But we're also really busy. So many times we don't reward good behavior because we're busy, other things take priority, maybe we're juggling crises, all kinds of reasons. But we're a nation of people who are vastly unappreciated or feel unappreciated and they're not getting the feedback they need in order to do the best possible job. Now, I, I saw the other thing that you'd also said in the book was that sometimes the worry is for some people that if they give them praise, that if they give them praise, they're afraid that then if they, in other words, the other side of that, if they praise them, some of the people that then give them more work. It's like, oh, you're yes. doing really, really well. And instead of actually praising them, they just, because they're doing really well, they just give them more work. Yes. And this is Which a. I think it's like, uh, you know, why would you want if someone who's doing really, really well, just give them more work? It's kind of like you're going to make that. So that's the other side. The employee that's doing really, really well, they don't actually go up to their standard because they're afraid if they do really, really well, that the, their employees is going to give them more work. And there that's are employees exactly. that do that. Instead of just oh. honoring that person, like you said, thanking them, they just pile the work on them more and pile more work on them, pile more work on them because they are a really effective employee. So we'll talk about that more. I know that in other lessons that are coming up. But that just came to me because I know that's the flip side of that. Well, and that's, I call it the ride a good horse syndrome because many times we find the best possible person and it doesn't matter what their actual job is. Every time we really need something done right, we always give it to Carly. Carly shows up, Carly gets it done every time. We always know we can rely on Carly. The problem is, it's not Carly's job. Maybe it's Bob's job. So Bob knows if Bob just lays low, they'll give it to Carly. He doesn't have to do his job. He can go off and do whatever he wants. He's still getting his full paycheck and Carly's doing all the work. So managers have to be very careful to hold people accountable as well to make sure that the people who are supposed to be doing the job are doing the job, but also that the people who is your go-to person, the Carlies of the world, that we're not burning them out by giving them every project, every high level visibility issue, every time we really need something done right, instead of holding the person who's supposed to do it accountable for doing it. That's a tricky one, and I and I really do love the one about giving the gift. And you, let's go back to that other one. Let's go back to number one for a second. In your book, you were talking about how to get the feedback in terms of how do we know what to give people in terms yeah. of doing the little surveys to find out well what do you need from us? Let's let's say someone um, doing the little surveys in terms of is it gift cards? Is it money? Is it and then that's tricky because if you're in the, like you said if you're in service you can't give money. So Correct. talk about that a little bit because that's interesting. I don't think people well, realize they, that depending on where you work you can't just give money to employees. You can't give bonuses, for example. So you're talking about f doing surveys to find out what you can give, or well, not necessarily what you can give, what they want right. as the incentives. So that's yes. an interesting one. So talk about that, that a little bit. Oh, thanks. There's two things that come to play here. First, if you work for the federal government or for the military, there are federal rules that say what you can and cannot give an employee. For example, nothing can be over a $20 value, and if it is, the employee could wind up having to actually repay the government for that amount of thing. You can't give a federal employee a gift, for example. However, one of the things that you can always do is you can always say thank you, and you can do that in the form of a thank you note. Um, I'm a big fan of a handwritten thank you note because we simply don't get them anymore. You can't sometimes give people cash. You can't sometimes give people that trip to Hawaii. But you can always send them a thank you note. Now, what I like to do is I try to find, I, I keep a variety of gift cards in my desk. And I try to find for the people who I'm trying to thank. Do they like coffee? Do they like a certain restaurant? Do they, you know, shop for their kids' clothes at Target? Do they, where do they like to go? And I try to just include a $10 or $20 gift card when I'm tr truly trying to thank someone. And you'd be amazed. It does not have to be $20. A $5 gift card is just as good as a $20 gift card in people brain as well as dog brain. And this is where I learned it, actually. My dog trainer said, if you're going to treat your dog, it does not matter if you give the dog 
a tree, a piece of chicken that's this big or a piece of chicken that is this big. The dog still thinks of it as one treat. So, so if you're going to try to reward your dog more frequently with tiny, tiny treats is much better than a big piece of chicken. And I went, oh, well, that's really interesting. And that's kind of how I look at my thank you cards, that it doesn't have to be a $20 gift card every time. But if I'm just trying to say thank you to somebody and I say, hey, have a cup of coffee on me in a gift card, that works out really nicely. I'll give you a real world example that happened just a couple weeks ago. I was out at Vail and I was doing a program and one day it was in one hotel and one day it was in the next hotel. And so I had to be at the next hotel at 6 o'clock in the morning with all of my gear. And the hotel security said, we'd be happy to drive you over to that hotel. It was only about three blocks away, but it was under construction. At 6 o'clock in the morning, we'll escort you over there. So sure enough, the security guy shows up helps me with my stuff, you know, I had the three big bags of stuff and the projector and the computer and everything, drives me to the other hotel and walks me into the room. It was dark and making sure I was okay. And so I said, you know, normally a bellboy or a porter or, you know, Belma, somebody would be helping you with this. And I looked at the guy and I said, I don't want to offend you. I said, but I would like to offer you some kind of a tip. And I had a tip in my hand. I said, but I don't want to offend you. And Carly, he was perfect. He said, he said, a tip would offend me. He said, it was my pleasure, which was an awesome, awesome thing for this man to say. And I said, that's awesome. And I appreciate that. And I will tell the world that you did this. I said, but can I at least buy you a cup of coffee? And I reached into my other pocket and pulled out a $10 Starbucks card. I said, will you please have a cup of coffee on me? And he said, that I will accept. Thank you very much. So again, it doesn't have to be this big monstrous gift. The whole idea is just saying thank you and doing it in a way that, that is meaningful to someone. And when I say meaningful, and I do talk about this in the book, if you're going to have an employee rewards program and say you're going to give people football tickets, well, guess what? Not everybody likes football tickets, so don't give them football tickets. Don't waste your money on that. Or if you're going to give them a plaque, what are they going to do with it? Throw it in the drawer, throw it in the basement? That may not be helpful for them. So find out by getting to know what really works for them that will touch their lives more than just the generic plaque or the standard, oh, every month somebody gets basketball tickets or something like that. And I'm not saying you have to spend a lot of, you know, copious amounts of time on this, but it's pretty easy to ask someone's, you know, direct supervisor and say, hey, Carly's going to get this award at the end of the month or, you know, we want to recognize Carly for producing this video that really highlighted what we needed to highlight. Do you happen to know where Carly likes to eat or shop? or what she likes to do. And the supervisor or other employees will know. And on that, I have three rules when it comes time to rewarding good behavior at work. First, try not to pit people who are working in a team against each other. And we do this all the time. We have, say, Teacher of the Month Award, Teacher of the Year Award, Employee of the Month. Well, wait a second. You're asking these people to coalesce as a team. However, now you're saying pick the best person or the boss has to pick the right person. Any way you cut it, somebody's going to have their feelings hurt. And if you come in second every single month for the teacher of the year, you know, you're, it's the Susan Lucci award. You know, you're always coming in second. You're never quite winning the award. And that makes people feel bad. Worse, what if you're never nominated? What happens to your motivation? These incentive programs are supposed to be incentives, positive incentives and rewarding good behavior. But if all that happens is people get resentful and Carly gets it month after month after month and she's our employee of the year and then somebody says, hey Janet, can you go work with Carly on this project? Janet's going to go, really? Carly? Carly needs my help. I don't have to help Carly. And because Carly's so perfect. Carly wins these awards. Carly, Carly, Carly. And all of a sudden you've created a resentful working environment when you're trying to create a team. So we have to be really careful not to pit people against each other. And I agree. And so what I liked about what you were saying earlier is I like the idea of doing a survey and actually saying, would you know, what do you like? Do you like would you like restaurant cards? And what are your favorite restaurants? Would you like, like you said, would you like, do you like Starbucks? Do you like the coffee bean? Do you want McDonald's? I mean, whatever it is. I mean, and have them like little, ch you know, each employee check off what restaurants they like. Check off what gift cards they may like. Because then you're at least giving them, 
there's nothing worse than getting even I mean I do that with friends at Christmas time. I'd rather give them a gift card to something they want than give them a gift card to something they're never really gonna use. I stopped a long time giving presents that I know people are not gonna want. It's like I'd rather give them a gift card to a store that I know they're gonna want to go to. A restaurant I know they're gonna want to go to. I don't want I don't want to give things anymore things to people they're not gonna use. Or that the worse yet. They're going to have to stand in line to return something I gave them. I, I personally don't want to go stand in line to return something. It is so exhausting. Why put someone else that you care about through that? So why not give them a gift card to a place that you know that they're going to be really jazzed and excited to go buy something at? You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Unless you know them so, so, so well that I can go to the store that they love then I know exactly what they're going to want because they've already told me. Because they, or they've been really, really like very specific about what they want. Okay, then I know what to go get them. And how, and honestly, how often, even with the people that you really, really, really know, how hard is it to buy for people nowadays? Because oh, usually terrible. everybody has what they need. So it's almost easier just really to say, okay, this year what gift card from what place do you want? And then give them the gift card to that specific place that they want and let them go have fun, you know, really. <laughs> I mean, it sounds, you know, a little less, um, I guess, more cold and mechanical. As far as I'm concerned, I'd rather write an amazing note, decorate okay. something really fancy and, and, and a, a, you know, a, a felt heart note from my heart that I write. I do some really fun graphics for people, and, like, I'll do a really cool card that I, you know, that I do and, and do some really cool photography with my flowers and write something really awesome that's for my heart. And then put the card in that you know from the gift card from the place that they want. So so at least it's a piece of me, and at the same time it's um, you know at least the store that they want. You know what I mean? That type of thing. Absolutely, and so, you know, and you know, know what they really treasure is the actual note. Exactly. It's, it's the, the card is kind of a wow. She really thought. Again, with thank yous, we frequently think it, we just don't do it. And when you we when you put the pen to paper and you put the gift card in there, it, it's like giving those two dog treats. It's like here's a note and here's a treat. You get both, and it's and it's it's more meaningful. The note is what people save. The gift card they might take it home, they might take their kids for whatever, but they save the note. And that's what I think is people don't understand that a heartfelt thank you note from somebody they care about and someone they respect people hold on to notes I mean think about your last birthday and the cards that you kept and the cards you threw away the cards exactly. you threw away were dear Carly happy birthday whatever the ones you kept were dear Carly thank you for being such an amazing inspiration to so many people I follow you every single week I love watching your posts I love seeing what you do thank you for being my daily inspiration and on your birthday I want to honor you with a thank you and please have lunch on me know I was thinking of you <laughs> and I just got something like that the other day with a book <laughs> from somebody yeah and I, and I actually posted it on my wall and the actual card it's really cool and it says gratitude on the outside and it's a That's really it. cool card and I'm never letting it go because it's got spirals and says gratitude on the outside exactly and as a matter of fact you have to tell that story about that guy the um, that saved your card for, that first came into your office and you said really and he walked out mm -hmm. and then you said you moved positions and he and you found and you saw him like what was like I don't know honey months or however long later and you saw the card on his desk yeah it was it was one of those moments that I have to I have to share with you that I did he he had a real hard time adapting to the rules that we were supposed to be working with because he hadn't had to do that and again it's like a puppy that was trained badly from the get-go now you have to retrain the dog when it's an adult dog and it's harder the second time and and dogs and people are more resistant to learning new things. They just are. We are. We're hardwired that way. So he was resistant. And when I finally saw some forward motion with his efforts as well as resorts, with his resort his results, I wrote him a card, left it on his desk on a Friday afternoon. On Monday he came back and said, he holds it up and he says, Is this a joke? And I said, no, it's not a joke. I really appreciate everything you've been doing, and I and your efforts been tremendous. And I know it's hard. I recognize it's hard. And I didn't think very much of it. Two and a half years later, I was at I was at a different base. He was at a different base, and I saw that card sitting on his desk. Two and a half years later, and I have to tell you, I was completely humbled by the fact that first 
anybody would keep a thank you note for that long and that it was something that he valued that much to carry around with him for a couple different other jobs and it tells me that people are unappreciated and if we are the people who do appreciate other people we can go pretty far and we can make a difference actually it also goes to show that that one thing that you did impacted him on a level that you know, sometimes it's like, you know how you have the, the, the one teacher when you might have been in fourth grade or fifth grade that did something that changed a wire within you? Somewhere yes. that moment of you doing that for him shifted something within him. It did. It shifted something within him to get that what you did, he felt truly appreciated in that moment. Because he wouldn't have carried it with him for two and a half years if it didn't. You told him in that moment that you loved him in some way. I'm serious. Something mm -hmm. in him, he, he's like some children didn't have that growing up. They weren't told that they were truly appreciated or that they were truly loved. And somewhere within him, his little inner child got that from you. Because as an adult, he wouldn't have taken that with him for two and a half years. It's like, so you were that teacher in that moment for him. And well, that, you, that, that is amazing. That story that you took that with him for two and a half years. And other people I know have similar stories, and I'll share with you that if you ask most people, and you, what you say about teaching is exactly correct, and you've been in that, in that job, that yep. if you ask people, if you say, how many teachers have you had in your life? People will say 15, 20, 22, depending upon how many schools change, whatever, college. And it could be as high as 30 or 35 if you went to grad school, 40. And if you then ask them the question, how many teachers touched your life? They will frequently tell you two. Two. Two people touched their life out of maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 teachers. And when I talk to my teachers, I say, you know, every semester, every school year, you have the opportunity to be that one person that changes someone's life. So take what you do very seriously and make sure that you're doing what you do for all the right reasons. And this, I think, ties into your point on ethics and behaving ethically at work, at home, in all realms of our life. Absolutely. Making sure that people do things for the Absolutely. right reasons. Absolutely. And I want to tie that back to not just at work, because you and I are obviously in social media groups together. That ties into Facebook, Twitter, any social media platform you're on, you need to play that out ethically as well. I'm, I get so tired of seeing what I see on Facebook walls. It's it just, oh, uh, God. Anyways, let's get back to your book as well because I know we've gone off on a little bit of a tangent. I just think, and you're right, because I've honestly, I can tell you right now, there's been two teachers in my entire life that impacted my world. So that number really was stuck off me, was two. Um, anyways, um, so now we, we've touched upon, I do want to get back to ethics though because that's so okay. important. Um, we touched upon um, the, the thank you notes. I didn't want to gloss over that because that is such an important, important piece. Mm -hmm. And I love the survey idea, so I want people to implement that at work because I think we need to actually implement some fun games. And there's lots of ways of doing the surveys. The surveys can be a really fun game to do at a meeting and to get to know our employees and to get to know our coworkers. It's a great team-building exercise to do, by the way. I've done it. It's, I, I take the time when we're doing our meetings. To, it's a team building exercise, and you, I, I do it with the fruit bowl exercise, which is a whole other conversation. It's a, get, a getting away. It's a, a way of getting to know your employees to see how they pick the fruit. You get to know their personalities, and um, it's a, anyways. But you, there's lots of ways to do team to do team building exercises while at the same time getting to know what they like, what they don't like, and so you're then you can actually find out what to get them. So take that time and opportunity to find out what gifts that you can give them, whether they're in the service when you can't get, give them money, or whether you can give them money, or, or whatever type of bonuses, programs you can do. Do not pit them against each other. Use Mary's tips and tools when it comes to that. And because this is also a podcast, Mary, please let people know where they can find you, because we're on a podcast and a video show. So where can they find you, Mary? My website is www.productiveleaders.com productiveleaders.com and you can email me at mary at productiveleaders.com and I and also, personally answer everything. 
And also, I just want to let everyone know, too, um, we are going to be giving away two books of Master Your World. It will be a PDF. It's not going to be a hardcover. Um, so we are going to be looking at people who give us good feedback because I want I want I wanted to give it to somebody who's going to read the book. I don't want to just give the book away and have someone not read it. The book is very valuable, loaded with rich tips. Um, I have read it. It's absolutely wonderful. So um, I really want someone to, to really read it and get some value from it. So um, as everyone knows, I always put together a really great page. It has the embedded video. It has the embedded podcast. has all of Mary's information. We're not done with this episode yet. I just wanted to put that out there and um, just let people that are on the podcast know, know all that. And now we're going to continue with some more tips from the book. So Mary, that- take it away with some more tips. Oh, thanks. So the second major rule is don't reward bad behavior. And you would think that would be logical and normal, except in the workplace, we frequently don't stop people from doing the wrong thing. Maybe they're habitually late. Maybe they are people who are always always late on a project, or they're always over budget, or fill in the always whatever that you don't like at work. Many times, their managers and supervisors don't do anything to pull them in, and they don't correct the bad behavior for a couple reasons. We don't correct bad behavior when we see it at work for a couple, because we don't want conflict. We don't want tension. We are afraid of not being liked. We are afraid of them um, thinking that we're picking on them. All kinds of fear-based reasons why we don't correct bad behavior at work when we see it. But the problem with that is if you're a manager and a supervisor and you let people continue to do a bad job, you are setting them up for failure. You are not helping them. In fact, you are hurting them. And as soon as budget cuts happen, those people are going to be the first people fired because you as a manager did not want to do your job by making them do theirs. And so when we talk about don't don't reward bad behavior, that's exactly the good horse that I was talking about before. That We give all the work to Carly because we know she's going to do it, but we don't make Bob do his job. Why? Because Bob gets argumentative, Bob comes up with excuses, Bob gets defensive, and frankly, we're kind of hoping that Bob just goes away, disappears. But the other problem we have is we think think that our employees or the people we work with should know better. And it's kind of like my parents went and got a dog from the pound, and the dog was three. And when they would call the dog, they kept the dog's same name. The dog didn't come. And they and they were frustrated. They said, why doesn't my dog come? I said, because the dog maybe hasn't been trained. And they said, but the dog is three. I said, that doesn't mean the dog knows what to do. We at work assume people know what it is they're supposed to do. And that's not always true. That's why we have managers and supervisors and leaders. So if you don't help people to become a better employee or to become a better worker, then you are allowing them to be obsolete and their future relies on you. And you're the one hurting them by not helping them. And that goes ties into is it criticism or is it feedback? It, you know, you can give people feedback and not have it be criticism. It's all right. in the delivery. If yes. I am, if I say to Mary, you know, you're mean, or you know, it, it's like it's just your tone of voice. You know, it's a delivery. If it's, I don't know, I can't explain. You know what I'm talking about, right? I it's do. Tone of I voice. do. So, so for example, you have to give people feedback based on first off how they're going to interpret it and make sure that you're doing it to get the behavior you want. If you simply tell somebody, well, you're mean, that's your own frustration coming out. That's not helpful. What you can say is, as a manager, hey, I notice that when you're talking to when you're talking to our clients, you're very intense. And when you're very intense, people sometimes think you're abrupt or rude or they're perceiving you as being mean. And I don't think you mean to come across this way. So here's a few techniques that have helped me. You might want to smile more when you talk. You might want to slow it down. You might want to pause and give them time to give you some comments back. But try not to be quite so abrupt. Do you think you could try that and let me know how it goes? So. 
you're, what you're saying is, I've observed this behavior, this is not the behavior I want, and this is what I'd like you to do to change it. You're not, and you as a boss are not being mean by doing this, you're helping them. By the same token, if you've got someone who's working on a project, and you don't want them working on that project, and they love this project, you pull them in and say, I need you to redirect your attention toward this project because our deadline is Thursday. And then you ask them, do you need anything else from me to make this Thursday deadline happen? And they will either say yes or no, but either way, you've redirected their priority. Just like you when you're redirecting your preschoolers. If they're heading exactly. off towards something dangerous or something you don't want them to do, you redirect them in a way that you are capturing what it is you want them to be doing. Exactly, and that way they're not feeling penalized by you taking them away from a project that may be, and it is, it's all redirecting. So they're not feeling bad like you're taking them away from something that you don't want them to be doing, you're taking them into another direction. And if they right. have questions about it, you just say, I really need you over here because of X, Y, and Z. And you don't say that you're taking them away from here because of X, Y, and Z. It's all redirection. And then it's the same That's thing exactly with feedback. Right. You can still give, like you said, that was a beautiful redirect. It's all reframing. And that's the wonderful thing. I always encourage people to take courses on negotiations, NLP, reframing, because all it is is reframing. It's just redirecting and reframing. You can give someone the most amazing and also detrimental news, and it's all reframing, posturing, and voice and tonalities. Yes. You can still you can still still tell someone in a weird way that they're mean and not do it with, you know, that vocal of like screaming at them and telling them they're mean. Like you just did that beautiful redirect and you were just telling them that they were slightly being mean in a different way. So you can give anyone any type of feedback. And it's mm -hmm. also the other person too. How are they taking it? I mm -hmm. love feedback because it gives me the opportunity to grow or be angry if I choose to get angry. But that's that's my stuff. If I choose to get angry from the feedback, that's my stuff. So I always, and I also tell people that. When I bring people in for meetings, I always tell them, we're going to have a meeting. How you choose to take it is entirely up to you. You know, it's like we need to also train our people. And that's the other thing, too, is we need to train our staff. We, and we need to give them courses on communication, on mm -hmm. feedback, and how to take feedback. And that's part of the problem, too, is we don't train our people. We just, like you said, that dog, the three-year-old dog, they, you know, we're assuming they know how to take feedback. We're assuming they know about communication. We're assuming they know how to do X, Y, and Z. If we don't train them, we're just assuming they know all this stuff. And we're so setting everyone up for failure. Take the time to give them courses on negotiation. Take mm -hmm. the time to give them communication courses. Take the time to give them communication. You know, it's like we need to train our people on these things. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. If you ask any employee, and I don't care what company they work they work at or whether they work for the best boss ever, and you say, so, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you love your yearly employee performance appraisal meeting with your boss? <laughs> they hate it. Not only that, their bosses hate it. Yeah. Because, because they think they're going to get yelled. It's like being called to the principal's office. Yeah. <laughs> and people hate it because people take feedback if, they're, if it's all glowing, but very few people want criticism. So because of that, we haven't been taught to give helpful criticism, and I don't want to call it criticism, but helpful suggestions on how to be better. Yeah. And we use that once a year time. So you, if you know it's a week from Friday, you start dreading it right now. You start dreading it, oh gosh, what are they going to say? What are they? It's like being called to the principal's office when you don't know what you've done wrong. And reality is, if we were doing our jobs all year round, our yearly performance appraisal would be, so you know you're doing a great job, you would nod, they say, I especially love this, you would nod, they would say, and oh by the way, thanks for working on this project, is there anything else that you think I, can, I as a boss can do to help you become a better employee? What are your goals in this company for the next year? What are your goals for five years? What training would you like? That's what it should look like, but that's not what it looks like in most places. See, and I, don't, I don't think this. I and I'm not going to say the, I'm not going to say the word I'm going to say. I I wish they would change that formula. I really yeah. do. Yeah. I think monthly reviews or monthly suggestions or even 
bi-monthly suggestions. I think the yearly is like sabotage, honestly. I think it it's like set up for disaster. I just think it should be monthly celebrations or something. I think the whole wordage is, is just a setup for people having nervous breakdowns and bosses freaking out and employees going, oh my God. It, sh it literally should be a party or something, a celebratory something. It just anything except the system that we have now. <laughs> and I, I think, Carly, I think most employees and managers would all agree with you because it's not fun for anybody. It's not. And I don't think it's even helpful. I think it's literally, it causes their inner child. It's like, I, I love this one. And that's why I don't even use the word goals anymore with clients. I use outcomes. Because nice. it's like putting the student who studies at home, how many, how many people, you, you, I know you've dealt with this. How many people do you know that can study for exams, study, 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 study at home, study at home, at home, and they get in front of the test and what happens? They freeze. Completely freeze. Clients. I want you to write all your goals out. Now, if I tell them that let's work on outcomes, they don't have any reaction whatsoever. Goals is the same thing as when they tell them that here's the test. For some reason, panic, panic. It's like because we've been raised with test and goals. Test, you need to have your goals. You need, you know, it's like my grades, I gotta have an ABC. When I start telling them, well, let's work on the outcomes. Let's, you know, let's work on the. They don't, they don't panic as much. So I don't even use that word anymore. I, I just banished it from my coaching programs. And I, oh my God, so much better. We're still doing the same thing. It's just a different word. It's just like, you know, and they don't have all this anxiety. It's ridiculous. Because, because in changing that one word, you're getting the outcome that you want, which is them understanding what their outcomes are. Right, Brilliant. and it's the same thing. It's just outcomes. And I'm like, right. okay, no, I don't have all this, you know, they're not, you know, all stressed out. And, you know, they're not like studying, studying, and all of a sudden they get in front of the test and they're like, you know. So I'm like, you know, and it's funny, it was because I've done so much studying with the unconscious, and it's all unconscious stuff. It's the same thing about the yearly thing, you know. It's like, forget the yearly thing. Let's just work on the monthly thing. Okay, let's work, let's go, let's just work on, if you forget about the monthly thing, let's just work. Let's just work. We have our, let's, we have our outcomes for the, for the, you know, for the month. We're working towards this, we're working towards that, we're working towards this. We got a movie coming up, we got a show coming up, you know, we got whatever we're working on. You know, instead of all these terminologies, it's like losing weight. Who the heck wants to lose weight? What are you attempting to lose? What do you want to find what you're lost? If I lose my keys, it's like, wouldn't you want to go find your keys? So why are you attempting to lose weight? I mean, I love our terminology and our language. It makes no sense whatsoever. I don't think people think about that. It's like, the terminology is like death. The words that we come up with sometimes blows my mind. I don't think we've ever really sat there and thought about some of the words that come out of our mouth and the impact it has on our psyche. There's like we, we um, there's just, I would never use those words with clients because it just trips right. them up and they get all freaked out. And when we start getting into the unconscious monkey mind and the unconscious storytelling and the stuff that comes up from those words, and if you just shifted those words, it's amazing how people get calmed down. So, anyways, you know, young lady, we need to wrap this up. And you're going to be on many more times. So we're going to be going book by book by book. So you've got many more times to come on. It's so fun to talk to you, Carly, that we just, time flies so fast. It so, always does. Okay, so you have, you have a few minutes here to wrap up so why don't you tell me what you'd like to leave with the audience what are some golden nuggets that you would love to say to conclude the storytelling of master your world so master your world in sum takes its line from George Kanahele a Hawaiian man who identified the word kina ole and kina ole means do the right thing at the right time with the right spirit to the right person every time. And that's Ooh, what the book is about. I love it. Kina ole. Kina ole. And mahalo and aloha to everyone all over the world.
Yes, Mahalo and Mahalo means here. thank you to anyone who does not know, and Aloha means much love and blessings to everyone all over the world. So, it is always my honor. You are so much fun, Carly, and I appreciate your energy, and you're so much fun. Oh, I thank you, and you are such a blessing. I love having you in my life. Thank so, you so to, much. I feel the same. And, uh, um, and everyone, I love bringing you valuable valuable content and valuable guests such as Mary C. Kelly. She's just a blessing and always full of valuable insights and all her books are just full of wonderful, 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 wonderful tips and um, I will definitely be looking for those, those comments and feedback so I can get you to them and make sure to reach out. Anything you'd love to hear about or learn, please let me know. And for tonight, I leave you. You've been with your guest, me, Carly. I'm not your guest. I'm your host. But you've been with my guest, Mary C. Kelly. And Mary, where can they find you again? Productiveleaders.com. And they can email me directly, mary at productiveleaders.com. And you can find me, your host, at carlyalissathorn.com. And I will be putting up links to a full blog post that will have the embedded video and the embedded podcast with everybody's information and a link to all her books and links to everything. So for tonight, I leave you and I look forward to next time. Good night, everyone.